looking at the lake and and chatting and networking, but that wasn't possible this year. So thank you all for taking the time to join with us. First, I would like to welcome and introduce some of our, our key players in our Safe Haven program. First is Kara Lorenz Goings, our Assistant Director. Angie Shepard, our Elder Abuse Victim Specialist Program Manager. Erica Cooper, our Safe Haven Support Coordinator. Trisha Comet, our Housing Development Coordinator. And, and we also have joining us Stephen Reiser, our um, Region 2 Area Agency on Aging Board Chair. Glenn, will you talk to us about Zoom etiquette? Yes, so uh, just a couple of things to make it a little bit work better for everybody. Uh, one, I wanna remind everybody or let you know uh, that the event is being recorded. Um, we're gonna mute everybody uh, during the main part of this. And at the end of each of the guest speakers uh, time, we will open it up for a few questions as time allows. Um, and then ask everybody after you've uh, had a chance to ask your question, please uh, mute yourself again. Uh, when you are talking, if hopefully you can minimize the background noise so that everybody can hear what's going on. And then we will be monitoring the uh, chat box. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, you can post them in there or comments. Uh, please be respectful, of course. And if you have any technical issues, you can either post them in the, in the main chat box or direct them uh, to me, um, and I will be uh, monitoring that as well. So hope things go smoothly, but let me know if you have any problems. Thank you, Glenn. So first off, you know, Region 2 Area Agency on Aging, we're a nonprofit organization that positively impacts the lives of older adults and adults with disabilities in Jackson, Hillsdale, and Lenawee counties. We assist with providing the tools and resources necessary to allow participants to live independently in their community. We are one of 16 Area Agency on Aging organizations in Michigan, and we were created by the Older Americans Act in 1965. Region 2 Area Agency on Aging was created in 1974. And again, we serve Jackson, Hillsdale, and Lenawee counties. Our primary activities include ad advocating for the needs of older adults, identifying needs of seniors and adults with disabilities, and work on plans to address those needs. We administer federal, state, local, and private funds to support those services. And we provide in-home services such as home delivered meals, personal care, access services such as transportation, community supports, and legal assistance, outreach activities, options counseling, adult daycare services, and community education. Home and community-based services are key to, to our mission. We, we want to keep, keep folks safely and in the community in the homes of their choice for as long as that is possible. We also help folks move out of nursing homes, and we have a tiered care program that includes medication management, friendly reassurance, information, and referral. We do many community wellness programs, advanced care planning, medical nutrition therapy, Medicare Medicaid assistance program, post home safety assessments, aging mastery program, assistive technology, and also many other special grants and programs. But why we're here today is to talk about our safe haven program, which is near and dear to our hearts. Angie, please talk to us more about Safe Haven. Erica's going to go ahead and take us through this first slide. Go ahead, Erica. Thank you, Angie. Um, I'm Erica Cooper. I'm with the Safe Haven program. I'm a sports coordinator. So what is Safe Haven? The Safe Haven program is a six to eight week program that serves older adults in Jackson, Lenaway and Hillsdale counties, and also older adults with disabilities as well. We provide temporary emergency housing, information and referrals to the criminal justice program, victim rights and other community services, such as like home delivered meals, um, transportation to doctor appointments or pick up medications. We also provide emergency first aid 
financial assistance if well, when they are going into more permanent and safe housing, um, emotional support, and also in crisis intervention. So uh, being that Safe Haven is an elder abuse prevention program, we just want um, to provide some education and awareness on the topic of elder abuse. And first of all, we want people to be aware of what, what exactly is elder abuse. And elder abuse can come in several different forms. Um, it could be physical or sexual abuse. It could be emotional, psychological, verbal abuse, neglect of, to provide care that is needed to an older adult. Um, Self-neglect is when an older adult is not able to meet their own needs and is not reaching out for help with that. Abandonment and also financial exploitation is another form of elder abuse. And how big is the problem? So many of you are aware that the older adult population is growing rapidly. Um, our baby boomer generation is, is getting older. And if you look at the graph, the blue bars show um, the population age 65 and older in our country. And the red line shows um, the proportion of the total population. So you'll see over the next 10 years, um, by 2030, adults age 65 and older will be roughly 20% of our population. And as, as that aging population grows, um, unfortunately so does the problem of elder abuse. According to the National Council on Aging, one in 10 Americans age 65 and older has experienced some form of elder abuse. And some estimates range as high as 5 million elderly who are in abuse situations every year. And that's only the cases that we know are reported. Um, there is a study that's estimated only one in 14 cases of elder abuse is reported to the authorities. So there's really um, a lot more probably going on than what we have documented. There are numerous risk factors for elder abuse. Um, just to highlight some of those individuals who have low social support, so those who maybe don't have family or friends or neighbors looking out for them. Those who have a di dementia diagnosis, that cognitive loss um, puts, puts them at risk. And a lot of times that causes them to not even know that they're being abused or to know how to report it to someone. Um, as far as trauma, People who have been in, in traumatic events, experience, experience those earlier in life, um, often are more likely to experience traumatic events later in life as well. Individuals with functional impairments and poor physical health. Studies have shown women are more likely than men to be abused. Those living with a large number of household members other than a spouse, and that's something that we have seen a few times with Safe Haven, um, oftentimes, there's a large family with an um, aging family member living with them, counting on their income to support the family, and that's not always what the, the older person is wanting or even able to do. Um, low socioeconomic status or living under the poverty level is also a risk factor. As far as financial exploitation, um, those who are at risk, Individuals who do not regularly utilize social services, and maybe they're not aware that there's help out there for them or at higher risk. Again, the need for activities of day-to-day -day assistance. So people who need help with personal care or um, homemaking, um, maybe medication management, those, those put people at higher risk. Those with poor self-rated health, those having no spouse or partner, African American race and lower age actually puts those individuals at higher risk. Those who are in their late 50s or 60s are at higher risk for financial exploitation. As far as perpetrators, um, it's most common that elder abuse victims are uh, being abused by somebody they know. Um, in almost 60% of reported incidents, the perpetrator is a family member. And in two thirds of reported cases, perpetrators are adults or adult children or spouses. So most commonly it is a family member, an adult child, a friend, a neighbor, somebody that's providing care for them. Why, why, did, we, why did we develop this program? So 
uh, back in 2017, when our agency was first developing the Safe Haven program, we worked really closely with Adult Protective Services and we still work closely with them. And what we found is that there was a gap in the community as far as providing services to older adults who've been victimized. Um, as I said, we work very closely with APS and they do a wonderful job uh, working the cases. Erica and I frequently talk about how grateful we are for the help of our APS workers, but they have their resources are also limited and there's only so much they can do. Um, so we wanted to provide some services and supports, a referral source for APS so that they could contact us and say, hey, we're, you know, our resources are low. What can you do? Is there something that you can um, provide for these um, participants that are needing some assistance? And um, we offer uh, immediate safety to this population. Uh, we try very hard when we have an older adult who is in an abuse situation, if they need to get out of their their placement quickly, we try to do that um, typically within 48 hours, if possible, sometimes sooner than that. Safe Haven is funded by a couple of grants. Um, in 2019, we restarted to receive the VOCA grant, which is the Victims of Crime Act through the Division of Victim Services. It's a federal grant. And with that grant, we were able to devote two full-time staff members to Safe Haven, which um, myself and Erica are currently in those positions. Um, and we also have the PREVENT grant, which is Prevent Elder Abuse and Neglect Today, which is through the State um, Aging and Adult Services. And we started receiving that in 2017. We did not receive it in 2018, but it resumed in 2019 and we have it again this year. We're very, very grateful for this funding and it really has helped us to grow and develop the program. But unfortunately, it doesn't cover everything. We see a lot of referrals um, and we're not always, you know, we have to be very, very careful with how we spend our funds. And we're always careful how we spend our funds at Region 2. Um, but having, um, asking for donations, asking for help from the community really is important to us because it makes sure that we can help every referral that we receive. Just to give you an idea of how many uh, people we have assisted over the years, back in 2017, uh, we assisted five participants and that was our very first year. We were still working to um, really get the program going. We didn't have any full-time staff devoted to the program at that time. So that's why there was only five participants that year, but starting in 2018, we grew that number to 20. 2019 was the first year we had two full-time staff devoted to Safe Haven and we were able to serve 47 participants last year. And so far this year, we are at 31. We just opened a new case this week that took us up to 31. So that's 103 older adults and adults with disabilities that we have provided assistance to uh, since 2017. At Region 2, we are very committed to making sure that the services and supports that we provide to our participants are, are quality. And we want our participants to um, have, be very involved in their, in their service plans. We want them, their goals to be in, um, involved in their service plan. And we want them to um, let us know if, you know if they're not happy with something or if there was something they needed that they didn't receive. So at, at case closure with Safe Haven, um, at, at, and when I say case closure, I mean when they've been safely rehoused and they're back in the community and they have everything they need, we ask them to complete an evaluation survey. <clears throat> and um, just to give you an idea, so far of uh, those that we have surveyed, 95% of those reported they felt they were given resources in the community to meet their needs. Um, we refer our participants out to a lot of other community organizations. We depend on other community organizations to help us with these cases. Um, and, and so I feel, I think our participants feel we're doing a pretty good job with that. 95% of those surveys reported they were given access to the legal system in order to make informed choices. Um, many times our participants need help filing a police report or they might need help going down to the courthouse to file a personal protection order against their perpetrator. Um, they might need a referral to legal services. We wanna make sure that they know um, and have information so that they can make the right choices in those situations. 
and 100% of those surveys reported they felt they received the supports they needed during their time with us. So we, when we do an intake, when Erica first meets with our participants, um, she, she tries to make sure that, she, that their needs are identified. So if they need help with homemaking or personal care, or maybe they have medical equipment that they need, or they need food or clothing or whatever it is they need, we make sure that's, um, that they're getting that. So, um, 100%, I'd say that's pretty good. And Kara's going to talk to us about our intake process. Hi everyone, I'm Kara. I'm very excited to talk on the subject of Safe Haven today. Um, just on a side note, this, this program is near and dear to my heart and, and the work the staff puts into it and the growth that's been in this program is really just great to see. So I am talking about the intake process right now. Um, just uh, on another side note, for intake process in general, for any program at Region 2, really the best thing to do is um, to call our main number at 517-592-1974 and or you can look for us through our website which is on the bottom of each of these slides. Um, again, if you can't remember the word safe haven, really the best thing to do is just to explain the situation to the person you're talking with and they will make sure the person gets the help they need. Also, if you ever suspect any of the forms of abuse that Angie listed, we always suggest anyone to call Adult Protective Services. That hotline you can find on the, and information you can find on the MDHHS website. Of course, our staff would also, if we were received some information that, that, that was needed. So related to um, intake in general for the Safe Haven project, um, related to the referral, what happens is the participant comes directly through our, our main line or sometimes it's been a walk-in and it can come through APS, it can come through other Region 2 programs, it can come through community partners, it can come directly from the family members or victims. And then what happens is really it moves very quickly where if the person is in an unsafe living situation, we put them in a safe temporary housing situation quickly. Um, Angie spoke to that a bit. And then as far as support goes, of course, our, our staff is compassionate and they identify services which the participant needs to live a healthy lifestyle. Each service plan is person-centered and based on the participant's personal goals, which is really what we've done at Region 2 since 1974. But for this program, again, where we're really looking at the person and what they need. And then it related to permanence, staff then um, works on rehousing the participant to the permanent, sustainable, safe, and desirable environment of their choice. It might be back to where they're living and we've helped get other people out of the mix or we've found a new housing um, place for these folks to live. So, Is do you want me to keep speaking on this? Sorry, Angie, no, I think, is Trisha available? I am Trisha Kamet, the Housing Development Coordinator at Region 2. Um, I just wanted to talk about some barriers that we find sometimes when we um, look for permanent housing for people. Um, sometimes there's a lack of vital documents. Um, they don't have a, a state ID, a birth certificate, or social security card. And those things are usually typically things that are needed when you um, do an application. Um, especially with safe haven, sometimes they might have to leave a bad situation quickly. So it's more, um, it, it could happen more often with that program. Um, and we can help come up with those IDs and re replacements for those. Um, some other uh, barriers are supply versus demand. There's not very many housing units out there right now. And there's a high amount of individuals looking to rent. Um, sometimes they have to make three times the amount of rent to even apply in an apartment unit and sometimes the background check and credit checks are a barrier and we can help work through some of those barriers to get some of those things resolved and hopefully get them a permanent unit. Um, we also look at accessibility, especially with people um, that have medical equipment. Um, we have to look at, you know, if there's enough room in there for them um, to make their housing successful and have enough room for what they need. Um, safety, there's a lot of discrim discrimination and housing schemes out there, so we look at that. Um, also with Safe Haven, you wouldn't want to take someone from a um, unsafe situation and put them kind of in the same area, so we have to look at the environmental safety also with that.
And Erica is going to talk to us about some other challenges that we see. For some other challenges for participants are needing some mental health or medication management and might not know how or where to get those services so we can help support them in giving agencies a call to give them the mental health services such as counseling or therapy um, or case management services that they're needing and also medication management. Some other ones is also social isolation and lack of family or informal support um, with our participants. I've been asked uh, many times over the last several months um, some of the challenges that we are seeing due to the pandemic. And um, what I will tell you is that we, we are working with the, the highest risk uh, people who, who are at high risk of developing complications um, if they were to contract COVID-19. So um, we have seen some challenges. Uh, one of the situations we had, one of, uh, we had a couple of referrals who, um, they met safe haven criteria, but they had been staying at one of the local homeless shelters and they were not able to continue to stay there because of their medical conditions. So uh, we were able to step in and keep them housed in a safe place and, and keep them isolated and make sure that they had food and um, everything that they needed and um, you know, follow, catching up with them, following up with them every day or every week, at least once a week, just to make sure that they are safe and um, answer any questions that they have. So um, so that is, that is one situation where I'm really glad that, that this program existed because we were able to help out. Um, some other challenges that we're seeing, um, housing, Trish already talked about general housing challenges that we see, but right now, uh, due to the cease eviction order um, and people staying where they're at, stay, you know, following the stay at home order, they're not moving around, which means that housing units are not opening up as quickly as they normally do. So for that, with that happening, we uh, have had to house people generally longer than the six to eight weeks, um, what we normally do, because um, we just haven't been able to get them into an apartment. We had a lady uh, last week who we, um, she had an apartment lined up. She had all her paperwork turned in, she was approved, but we were just waiting for the unit to open up. So um, those are some of the challenges that we're seeing. And I do foresee that over the next couple of months when the eviction orders are lifted, um, that we're going to probably see another influx in referrals. We have some new dreams and goals that we want to accomplish for Safe Haven. Uh, we started out really small, but we're looking at, you know, continuing to grow and develop the program. Um, over the past couple of months, we've been working with some consultants from TBD Solutions, and they've been really great to work with, and they are helping us to develop a plan to continue to grow and sustain Safe Haven and possibly even replicate it in other areas of the state or maybe even the country. We don't know. We'll see where it goes. But um, there are similar programs to Safe Haven um, in Michigan that are elder abuse prevention programs, but to my knowledge, Safe Haven is very unique in that we provide both case management and temporary shelter to our victims. So we're really hopeful that we can continue to, to grow and develop this program to be able to help more people. Something else we're working really hard on right now is developing a volunteer peer support program. Um, Erica and I were just talking earlier today and trying to identify some of our past participants that might be willing and able to be a good support to some of our current referrals. And that could be just as simple as, you know, a weekly phone call. But when you've been through a situation, um, sometimes you're able to help somebody else through what you've already been through. And we think that that would benefit both um, the current participant as well as the past participant. And just to help with that social isolation and, and lack of support, um, we're gonna be working really hard, hard on that over the coming months. And uh, Safe Haven, uh, we also facilitate a coalition, an elder abuse prevention coalition that meets monthly on the fourth Friday of every month at noon. We do a brown bag lunch, at least when we meet in person. Um, and it's a really great group of other community organizations um, that work with older adults. 
And, and our goal is basically to just continue to grow the safety net. We all want to make sure that we know who we can call when we one of our participants has a need. Um, that coalition is made up of um, legal services, local departments on aging, uh, adult protective services attends those meetings, um, our mediation dispute resolution, mediation program, really great group of people. And it, it makes it way easier when we have to make referrals. Um, I know I can just pick up the phone and call Brittany at legal services and you know she can she can help me out with whatever and she and it goes both ways people call us as well so it's it's really good building those relationships and then Kara's going to talk about our achievements yes thank you angie uh, it's very exciting to talk about the achievements of this program here you see a slide from uh, 2018, the National Area Agency on Aging Association Achievement Award we received for Safe Haven. Um, I believe it might be the first award Region 2 received at that level. We've received a couple in the last few years, which is really exciting to be recognized at that level. So, and of course, I have a list of achievements I'm going to go through. So again, Angie mentioned this is the fourth year of the Safe Haven service to the community. We've served a total of 103 participants in our three county areas. Uh, we've had exemplary participant satisfaction results. I mentioned this award we received in 2019, Region 2 actually did the first presentation ever at the National Area Agency on Aging Conference in New Orleans. We had a clip from uh, Carrie Castle from Adult Protective Services in the pre presentation. So she came to New Orleans virtually with us. Angie and I did the actual presentation. It was really a, a neat thing to do for the first time. We received the Liberty Bell Award from the Jackson County Bar Association on Law Day, May 1st, 2019 for Safe Haven. Um, in 2019, we were also donated funds from the Southern Michigan Chapter Golf Outing for this program. So it's getting a lot of community recognition and momentum. And we're very excited about that. We have sustained grants that Angie mentioned to um, help fund this program. Of course, she said we, we have more to do there, but we, we are proud of that. In 2020, um, this was the first year that Region 2 had rented a local accessible housing, um, a, two, two units, apartments for to service our safe haven participants. And this does offer some increased management and safety for those we serve. Um, and then here you'll see this slide was exciting also. The state had um, let this publication know about Safe Haven um, from the grants, the grant side of things. So they, they reached out to us and we were able to do the second wave publication, a statewide publication on the Safe Haven project, which was very exciting. Um, Erica is going to share with us a letter um, that was written by one of our recent participants. This is Sandra's story. Before coming to the Safe Haven program, I was living in a dirty, loud, and verbally abusive home. Every night, I'd go to the kitchen around 3 a.m. to clean the pig pen and then make myself something to eat. One night, I was taken to the hospital via ambulance and admitted into the ICU for two weeks. While I was there, I was connected with an APS worker that helped me set up, set up for an intake for the Safe Haven program. When I was discharged from the hospital via ambulance, I was taken to the Safe Haven house. There, I met with Safe Haven staff for my intake for temporary housing. I walked into a clean, quiet, and safe environment. There are no words to express my gratitude to this program and the people that run it. I had no idea how to find another residence and Safe Haven staff has done the footwork for me. I am blessed to have found housing where my two dogs and I can live safely. In my opinion, this program should be televised so more, so more people can be made aware it exists. People that are in similar situations that I used to be in. Again, these words don't express how I really feel. I truly appreciate you. Thank you, and God bless, Sandra, Rosa, and Golda. Thanks, Erica. I would just um, share that 
um, Sandra did give us permission to share that letter. Mm -hmm. um, and now our board chair, Stephen Reiser, is going to introduce one of our guest speakers. Thank you, Angie. And thank you, Sandra, for sharing your story with us. That's the reason why everyone plays their role uh, at the organization that they do. Uh, as Angie said, my name is Stephen Reiser. I'm the chair of the Region 2 Area Agency on Aging Board. And I wanted to take a moment and introduce a couple of the uh, other board members who are on. I'm actually going to recognize all the board members. If you're clicking through uh, the screens, you'll be able to see perhaps some of them that I mentioned. Our board is made up with representatives from each of the three counties in the region. That's Hillsdale, Lenaway, and Jackson. So from Hillsdale County, we have County Commissioner Bruce Caswell, uh, and then we have Curtis Gale, who serves as the Vice Chair of the Board. From Lenaway County, we have County Commissioner Chris Wittenbach, County Commissioner Bob Canablo, and Bob serves on our Board as the Treasurer. Uh, also from Lenaway, we have Keith Williams. Uh, from Jackson County, we have County Commissioner Tony Bear, Matt Dame, Debbie Eckleton, Megan Kaiser, and then uh, I am also a representative from Jackson County. Just a few brief remarks that I'd like to make before introducing one of our uh, speakers today. And that is, you know, we've heard a lot of talk about safe haven and it, it is all within our mission. So I wanted to share just a quick, the, the first part of our mission quickly. And the mission for R2 AAA states to improve conditions affecting the lives of the older adults and individuals with disabilities in the region. Hopefully everyone who is on today and may see this in the future if it's, or it is being recorded if it's, if it's shared, has clearly seen how this program uh, that, that we offer and implement fits within that mission. We are truly affecting positively uh, the lives of older Americans, older adults, or persons with disability by helping get them out of unsafe, uh, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally uh, situations and get them back on their feet living life independently. Um, I'd like to mention that this program uh, began when I, when I was on the board. It's something that I have seen uh, grow from you know, a, a sprouting seed to a full-blown plant over the last three years started as, you know, small grant dollars doing the best we could to, as Kara mentioned, now offering housing through a uh, duplex that we're leasing in the region. So if you know anything about Zoom, if you move your mouse toward the bottom, if you're on a computer, there's a reactions. I think it's very appropriate if everyone will join me in giving the round of applause to the staff using the reactions or clapping uh, because none of this would be possible without the staff. Uh, this is a program that the staff brought to the leadership and brought to the board and board valuing that continue to implement that thanks to the great work of the staff. It was noted that we use grant funds to cover as much of the cost as possible. Uh, we use generous contributions. And if you will join me in going to the chat feature, you will see both Glenn and I have shared information to support this safe haven program. So we can continue uh, to care for adults and persons with disabilities. This brings me to the point of the agenda where we get to introduce one of our two speakers. Uh, the first speaker is a friend of mine, is a friend of the agency, is a friend of seniors uh, in Lenaway County and the region. Our first speaker is Representative Ron Representative Ron Kelly, uh, she has small business where she provides services to seniors in populations. Uh, she most recently, before getting elected to the State House, was the director of the Adrian Senior Center. She's very involved in the I need to follow over on Facebook to see she spends almost no time at home. Uh, she's working with the Walked In Alzheimer's, the Adrian Symphony Orchestra, Habitat for Humanity, just to name a few. Uh, if you live in Lenaway County, she's probably your state representative as she represents most of that area. She has a husband and two adult children. And last thing that I just learned from communicating with her, 
Uh, and this is really a testament to her commitment to the work that we do and the cause of caring for seniors and persons with disability in our community. She is joining us from the House floor in Lansing or a room just off the House floor as the Michigan House is in session today, uh, but not wanting to alter our schedule, but still wanting to, not wanting to alter her schedule too much, but wanting to participate. She is joining us live from an office just off the House chamber. So Representative Collin, thank you so much for being with us. The floor is yours. Okay, well, good afternoon. And I'm not sure if you can hear me okay. Is my connection acceptable? Stephen was breaking up for me a little bit. Angie is shaking her head. She's the only one I can see. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for even inviting me to be part of this, this afternoon's meeting. What you do with your work with Safe Haven is tremendous. Um, the fact that you've received national awards and recognition speaks to your work is and how groundbreaking it is. Um, I'm, I feel both humbled and proud that it's our area agency on aging that is the umbrella over safe haven um, that is um, becoming a model for the country and how a community can come together um, through private donations as well as grant dollars to take care of a population that needs it the most. And I'm not sure if you're hearing me. Is my connection okay? Okay, great. Um, and so truly, Angie and Erica especially, thank you for what you're doing. As Stephen said, um, senior care, the, our older adult population is very near and dear. Not only was I the director of Adrian Senior Center. Prior to that, I had a home care company where caregivers would go into people's homes to provide services for those that needed a little help. And the fact that there are so many vulnerable and frail older adults is very real to me. And we know that that is the population most susceptible to the abuse that we're talking about and to the abuse that is widespread, um, the kind of abuse that is expected really to rise in the coming years as the boomer population is aging. Um, I know you touched on some of this already, but it is something that can should concern every one of us uh, is that most abuse is not even reported. The, we, the numbers that we do have are staggeringly high, I think, um, in abuse cases. One in 10 in Michigan is the estimate, but we also know that many are never reported because it's often a family member and there's a uh, the question a daughter or a son or a granddaughter or a grandson because there's fears about what may happen to them. So it's, this is a huge conversation and even uh, the work that you do through Safe Haven not only provides that safety net and the services that are so needed, I think it also brings awareness to a conversation that a lot of people would rather ignore or they simply don't even think about it existing. Um, so the numbers are huge, you know, and I think if we're not, if we're not careful, we can go into thinking the numbers are just numbers. I think you mentioned you've helped 103 or 130 or so since you've started and behind every figure on the page or on the computer screen is a human being. It's a real person. Now, these are moms and dads and grandmothers and grandfathers and sisters and brothers. And remembering that piece of it, um, to me, puts life and meaning into all these statistics that we're talking about. Yeah, the numbers matter and they're important and you have to make ends meet. But these, at the end of the day, this is about our seniors. It's about our community members. And I think, you know, what can we do? Because this can happen in any family, at any income level, any ethnicity, any religion. Um, no one is exempt from this possibility of occurring um, because it is often those that the victim knows and trusts and uh, has coming into their home. And so this, this work of safe haven is, is critical. Um, one of the things that I, I find 
I'm actually not just concerned, I'm almost, outraged is a strong word, but, but I am to a degree because it's so, so high, heinous when someone would do this to a vulnerable, frail, older member. But um, it's just that uh, it gets so little attention overall. I think older adult abuse, elder abuse, in the big picture in our communities at large, um, it doesn't get the attention it deserves. It's a greater number that are affected than even domestic violence victims. Not that that's not important. Um, and so I think that the awareness is an important part of all of this. I want you to know that I'm an advocate for, the, for this entire cause in our state government, I'm speaking when I can, sharing with colleagues, trying to bring things to the floor in the form of resolutions and highlighting the fact that um, this is real, that we can't ignore it, and that it's growing, and that services are needed. So I just had to vote real quick. Um, I'm not sure. Go there. So sorry about. Sorry, my apologies. And uh, just I'm going to have to wrap it up because we are in session right now. But I do want to say that from my perspective and knowing all the relationships that I've had through, the, through my previous work, through my business, as well as every day at the Senior Center, building relationships with the individuals there and their families, um, Daybreak Adult Day Services, right in the same building where I was. They just want to live safely, and they want to live with some dignity. And Safe Haven provides that for them when there's nowhere to go. Emergency housing, an emergency shelter for those who need to be removed is the number one thing that's needed, some could say. So if we could do anything to make seniors become safer and more secure, it would be emergency housing, the big piece of this. And you found um, in our filling in a missing piece that has to be put in place for the puzzle of providing full range of services to be a completed puzzle. So it, I'm your advocate and I just thank you for your work and commend you for your work. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brana. We appreciate you. <laughs> Does any, do you have a moment, a few moments to see if anyone has any questions, Representative? I think I do. I'm semi watching what's happening. There's a little office off the side of the floor that I'm sitting in and I'm watching. So yes, I think so. Do, does anybody have any questions for Representative Kali? Or do we have any questions in the chat? All right, well, thank you so very much for being here. We really appreciate your support. And I think Kara's Thank going you for to the you. opportunity and a bigger thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I get, have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. Um, Ron Tatro is here. He is the Vice President of Elder Law of Michigan, which is a statewide senior-focused nonprofit organization. And Ron's career is really dedicated to this work, and he is present and impactful at, at the state level um, related to elder abuse prevention and locally. In 2019, he was actually appointed to the Michigan Elder Abuse Task Force, which is super exciting. Um, to know someone at that, that level at the task force. And Ron has been a true supporter of the work we've done at Region 2, Area Agency on Aging, and Safe Haven. And we are so happy to have him here today once again to talk about this subject. Thank you, Ron. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> uh, it is a beautiful day, but I got to say the air conditioning feels pretty good at the moment uh, for being in. So I want to thank you for the kind uh, invitation to have the opportunity to visit with you uh, briefly this afternoon. You know, as, as I'm sitting here and I'm listening to all the fine work that Safe Haven is doing and I'm listening to Representative Kelly's uh, points, uh, you know, I realize that what we all know, but sometimes we forget about it, is that uh, it takes many, many different hands with many different approaches to resolve this, this hellacious issue of elder abuse that we have. 
Monday was World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, uh, which is celebrated around the world to recognize the challenges that, that seniors face uh, as it relates to elder abuse. Uh, and while there's people at my level that work on a lot of systemic things, uh, I really want to commend the people such as that Safe Haven and the AAAs and all these other folks who work at the very uh, basic community level. It's really the boots on the ground that make the biggest difference every day. However, there is sometimes the need for other players to come to the table to uh, provide support uh, to the people such as Safe Haven and the work that they do. And, and for the most part, I am fortunate and be able to play a role at, at that level. Uh, Kara mentioned that I am on the Michigan Elder Abuse Task Force. And she asked that I share a little bit about that organization and a little bit about uh, some of the activities that are currently underway. Uh, going back to 1999 and then again in 2007, uh, there was a series of studies done by the Michigan Supreme Court and the governor's office to take a look at elder abuse. At that point in time, there was a number of uh, uh, recommendations that were made, and unfortunately, over the years, uh, most of those re uh, recommendations never came to be. Uh, there was a packet of laws that was passed in 2011, uh, 2013, but basically has laid dormant uh, since that time. Uh, after uh, Attorney General Nessel came into office, uh, she met with the uh, Michigan Supreme Court and they agreed to uh, form a task force for the purpose of looking at uh, overarching or systemic uh, challenges and issues as it relates to abuse uh, here in Michigan. And subsequently the task force was, was formed. Uh, the task force started in March of 2019, so it's uh, been just a little over a year. Uh, there is about 100 members of the task force who serve on about uh, 15 to 16 uh, committees. Uh, I will say that uh, I have been immensely impressed with the people who serve on the task force. They're from an extreme, extreme diversity of professions who've come to the table and that they are really super engaged and they bring a lot of energy. But what I thought I'd share with you this afternoon is to give you an idea about the wide range of issues that systemic issues in particular that the task force uh, takes a look at. Now for the past uh, four months or so, uh, work has slacked off a little bit, not a whole lot. In fact, today we had our first uh, uh, team-wide meeting, uh, a task force meeting today, Zoom meeting, uh, it was like 100 people. Um, so you, the key there is you got to remember to have your mute button on uh, when you have a lot of people that are, that are engaged in that conversation. But uh, here are some of the highlights of the diversity of types of things that the task force is working on. From the court's uh, perspective, there's several things that, that are interesting uh, there. One of the things, if there is such a thing as a good thing coming out of the pandemic, one of the things that's come out of the pandemic is that it's forced a lot of entities, including our discussion today, and I wanna to say to Julia, I miss being on the waterfront down at the uh, boat club, but this is great, uh, has forced a lot of innovation and a lot of creation. And, and one of those players at the table looking at that has actually been the courts. What you may not be realize is that increasingly a large numbers of court hearings are being actually conducted virtually uh, and are being hosted on, of all places, the YouTube channel. So you can go in and you can look at criminal hearings, you can look at probate hearings, you can look at uh, other hearings that are, that are taking place across the state. It's not total, but it's in the process of, of ramping up. They're also doing some other neat things, uh, such as now they're doing online uh, conflict dispute resolution. They're doing that online. Um, they are doing other things online. On the, on the, once, the other side is though, that it's not been totally embraced yet for that process because uh, there are some concerns still about the lack of people in the courtroom and that interaction that you lose when, when people are not present. 
Another topic relating to the courts has been uh, the opportunity to create something called the Court Watchers Program. And that is a program uh, which engages a number of volunteers across the state who, at least up until recently, physically went into a probate court hearing for guardianship hearings and looked at those guardianship hearings to ensure that uh, processes were being filed or followed in and those types of things. Uh, on the legislative front, uh, you know, a lot of the constraints and restrictions and systemic issues that we have are really based in law in the sense that a law either uh, does not per, uh, prohibits uh, some interaction. An example of that would be the ability of APS to freely share their information with other players to some things that uh, have yet to be created. So there is a approximately 20 to 30 uh, elder abuse uh, bills that being proposed legislation in various forms, which is out there uh, making its way through uh, the systems. And, and some we think about in the sense that, well, we should increase the penalties if the victim is over a certain age. But there's other things that are happening out there that uh, is not so readily apparent until you begin thinking about them. So one example really is like uh, the ability of guardians and what can a guardians do with uh, seniors. Uh, currently guardians can basically uh, sell property uh, of seniors without their permission. They can basically take their assets as long as the assets are being used for the senior. But more importantly, they can basically relocate a senior. Uh, their wards. They can take them out of their home and place them somewhere else and subsequently sell their property. So there's proposed legislation which would address those types of issues. The uh, hot bill of the week, uh, actually it was last week, the hot bill of the week was a bill that was introduced by Senator Renstead that allows for the placement, for families to place cameras in the rooms of their uh, loved ones with inside of care facilities and to be able to remote that. Uh, there are a lot of pros and a lot of cons for that. I'm not sure where that is eventually going to, going to come out, but that's an example of something you wouldn't really think about when you talk about prevention, elder abuse prevention, until someone mentions it that and you went, oh yeah, you know, that, that's out there. Uh, it's interesting that one of the things we've been working on for the past year, and it's really now come to light in the last couple of weeks, and that's been the need for training for law enforcement and for prosecutors. Uh, the training committee, uh, has uh, put together a whole series of, of webinars. Uh, the good news is that because of the pandemic, a lot of uh, people have been in their office and they're looking for things to do. So they've been viewing the webinars. So since the first of the year, the webinars have been on topics, I should say, such as recognizing elder abuse, uh, financial records and the ability to access those records, uh, relationships uh, with APS. So since the first of the year, uh, approximately uh, 5,000 police officers and prosecutors across the state have viewed these webinars, uh, which means that uh, in, in many agencies, there's only one person that kind of looks at this. So there's been a lot of different agencies that's been involved and we think that's pretty positive. Uh, Another area that we're focusing on, the committee, uh, the task force is focusing on is uh, care workers and the need to train healthcare uh, workers on elder abuse related issues. Uh, there is a series of 11 uh, mods, uh, modules that are in the process of being completed. One of the challenges has been is because of the stay home, stay home orders and that uh, there's not been the ability to actually get out and do filming and bringing people together and doing those types of things. But I anticipate that we will start seeing those fairly soon, those, those mods. Um, another thing that's under discussion is, and I'm kind of looping this back, uh, relates to guardianships. And a few minutes ago, I gave you an example of some legislative uh, challenges. Uh, or legislative uh, avenues to, to take a look at this. Uh, one of the suggestions that's being studied is the creation of a state office. 
on guardianships. Uh, currently, guardians are registered with the local court uh, and can basically be anybody who wants to be a guardian. So it could be a family member or it could be another individual. Uh, and the question has come, does there need to be registration and training for guardians? And the short answer is yes, uh, there does. Uh, so this office would, in fact, uh, create a process to oversee the guardianship proposal uh, would be a place for uh, concerned uh, parties to file complaints and would be an investigative vehicle for them to uh, address those particular issues. Uh, and then the last uh, thing that's happening, which is, which is once again, elder abuse prevention, but we don't really think about it. Uh, relates to the Attorney General's office is currently reviewing the state's consumer protection statutes uh, to see, in fact, how they treat seniors and with a focus there on looking at uh, perhaps increased penalties if the victim is over a certain age, uh, whatever that age is. I would note that everything that the uh, Council is, is currently doing. Uh, we established a multicultural cultural review process and committee. So before anything goes out, it all goes to the uh, to this particular committee who uh, looks at it with a very wide uh, diverse group of people to make sure that it is a culturally appropriate and uh, culturally sensitive in the way that it's going to be presented. So I, I think, uh, Kara, that's my time that you asked, uh, but I'm certainly happy to respond to any questions that anyone might want to ask. Yes, thank you so much, Ron. So if anybody has questions for him, please feel free. questions? No questions for Ron? Okay, any questions in the chat? All right, thank you so much, Ron. We always appreciate your support and your knowledge and wisdom on this topic. And we appreciate the work you're doing at the legislative level. Thank you so much. So, all right, well, um, we've given you all of the information. We, you know now what Safe Haven is and what we do and the, and the problem that we're trying to prevent. Um, so why are we here? Well, we need your help. Um, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, our grants um, don't cover everything. They, they help us out greatly, but they don't help with everything. So we are asking for donations. That's the whole reason that we're here for the benefit. Um, but we want you to know um, what your donations will specifically be used for if, if you are able to contribute. Um, as we mentioned, we provide temporary emergency shelter. That's probably, I would say, the biggest cost that we incur. Um, we do have the apartments in Brooklyn that we utilize, um, but we, if those are full, we often need to put our participants in motels. Um, which can be costly. And that is definitely something that we would be using contributions for. Emergency food, clothing, toiletries. Oftentimes our participants come to us um, with nothing. They would put the clothes on their back. They had to leave the situation they were in very quickly. And um, so we're able to provide those things for them. Security deposits and first month's rent for permanent housing. Um, we do ask our participants to hang on to their funds as much as they possibly can during their time with us so that they can help co and cover those costs. Um, but sometimes um, that doesn't always work. And we do look for other programs and resources that can help with that. But it is something that Safe, ha Safe Haven can help with and something that we will would use donations for. Back rent for those who've been financially exploited and are at risk of eviction. We've had a few of those cases where um, Social Security funds were not taken from, from participants because of a scam, um, which then caused, caused them to not be able to pay their rent. And we were able to help keep them in their home by using our, our funding to um, pay their back rent and, and help, help them um, remedy the scam situation. 
housing needs, both, both for our apartments and for participants moving into permanent housing, furniture, beds, bedding, kitchen items, cleaning supplies. Um, our participants don't always have those things when they move into a new apartment. So those are things donations would be used for and transportation um, for specific needs. Um, that's also something we would use contributions for. So we're hoping that you will help us out and help support um, elder abuse prevention and help us continue to provide services to older adults who are victims of abuse or neglect. Julie, do you wanna take it away? Sure. You've learned a lot about Safe Haven today and and the, the issue of elder abuse in our community. So you know, we had a, lof a lofty goal of raising $15,000 towards our Safe Haven um, program. Real time, the amount right now that we've raised is approximately $3,500. So we have a ways to go, but we're confident that we can get there with your support and the support of you know, friends, family, and, and fr friends of seniors throughout the three counties. We've done, you know, a mail out campaign for, for funds and we, we continue to receive donations every day online and some, some checks in the mail. So whatever you can do, if you can support the cause, we would really appreciate it. Um, these funds that we get as Angie and, and the whole staff um, told you about really go to directly to to the people that we serve and many times when, when they're leaving an abusive situation they they come from from their original home with nothing so we we do do our best to work with lo local community partners but also we try to make folks comfortable and get them what they need for at home so i just invite you if you can't support today on our website you can you we invite you to mail a check-in or call us and, and we will do our best to, to help you understand where your funds would go. And you know, I know it's, it's a challenging time right now with coronavirus going on and many of the needs around the community. Um, but we are expecting the, the needs for a safe haven to only increase as people, you know, as the eviction orders end and people are losing their housing and as adult protective services start um, getting back out for in-person visits because that hasn't been happening so much lately. So anyway, thank you for anything that you can provide or support. Reach out to any of us here and we can answer your questions. I'll open up the floor right now for any questions that anybody has about Safe Haven and we're willing to field those questions. So anything out there, any questions anybody has? I'm just looking in chat to see if there's anything in there. If anybody's unable to unmute or something. Well, thank you for joining us today. And, and I invite the rest of the team here to say some thank you note, thank you messages too. But we just really appreciate you taking the time. I know our event, we know our event looked a little different this year. Um, we were all, you know, becoming more used to Zoom. I know we had our annual meeting via Zoom too this year, which was different for us. But we, we felt the, the message was still very important to get out. So thank you all for joining us today. And if ever you have questions, have a referral to our programs, any of our programs, remember the number 517-592-1974. Um, Give us a call or on our internet page, r2aaa.net is an online referral form. So any way that you can get in touch with us, there's an email address there too. And so just reach out and thank you all for joining us.